and welcome. Tonight on the show, we're joined by the CEO of the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission and the CEO of the Consumer Council of Fiji. Good evening and uh, thank you for joining us. Good evening. So in light of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic that has reached our shores, um, we have put in place many measures, especially this week. Um, the area of Lotoka is now isolated mm. and um, many other traders and, and, and things, a lot of things have happened this week, right? Mm. So if, if I could ask both of you to, I guess, summarize the new regulations that have been put in place for the benefit of the people of Fiji, especially in relation to traders and, and retail. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ziad. Uh, some of the things that we've done is, one, uh, we've been talking to businesses uh, through the Chamber of Commerce, through the Fiji Commerce and Employees Federation, as well as to uh, companies that we directly regulate, supermarkets, hardware, pharmacies, uh, ports, other regulated industries. We've given them advisories as well as checked for the first thing is that they have a business continuity plan, two, that they've got a preparedness plan, and that they have uh, rolled out some of this. The very reason that we want to check for continuity plan is to check business agility, meaning when times change, how can they adjust quickly to different uh, situations. The second thing is we have looked at specifically to essential food items and medication, is uh, looking at the supply chain. right? Now, this happened uh, way before the first case was announced. We started the conversation with the uh, traders. We started gathering market data. We started looking at any possible or potential supply chain disruption, knowing that China uh, is a huge uh, market for both supply and demand. Right? The demand for things like fuel oil supply for a lot of goods that's manufactured in China. So we're looking at supply and demand disruptions. And because of that, we started having conversations with uh, traders well before the first case was announced on how this is going to affect the supply chain if there was going to be delay. Uh, noting that uh, the shipments on this side of the world is dependent on uh, the number of containers that can be loaded in different ports in, uh, in Asia because we don't have the economies of scale to get a huge uh, ship here. And so these conversations had, has, had already started now. Uh, as soon as the first case was uh, announced, uh, one of the things that we did was to look at relaxing requirements to do with refusal to sell, uh, which is putting in place some common sense limits now. Mm -hmm. uh, this common sense limits basically allows uh, retailers, depending on the geographical location as well as their customer base, because different stores will have different customer base. For example, extra supermarket in Flagstaff will have a different uh, class of customers compared to, say, can save in Nasori. Right. So each uh, supermarket uh, is poised to uh, an analyze their customer base and put common sense limits on different products. And uh, these limits are then communicated back to FCCC so we know what these limits are. This, will, uh, this would allow for people to uh, uh, ensure that everybody has uh, access to essential items. So these are some of the things we did as a starting measure before. Uh, any of this uh, eventuating. So that explains the um, the notes at some supermarkets that you'll find uh, for yes. some products that there's a limit on yep. on those. Okay. Miss um, uh, Shandil, uh, on that note, when <coughs> it first hit, uh, when, when it first came to light rather, that there was a case that has been confirmed in Fiji, there were uh -huh. instances of people, especially on social media, going on and saying that there's price, gou uh, price gouging taking place instantly. Uh, you mentioned off camera that your teams had been out and about and that they weren't able to notice anything like that happening. Uh, one particular picture that had gained quite a lot of traction on Twitter was a can of tinned fish that was going for $8.79. However, after further investigation, it was found out that according to the price control measures set by FCCC, that is the original price for that product. With all of that as a background and as a backdrop, can you talk to us about what your teams have found out, though, in the past couple of days? Um, right. But as soon as, you know, the, the social media, the news circulated on social media, we could see chaotic situation in all the supermarkets, hypermarkets, and also pharmacies because people were running around to stockpile their pantries and, you know, whatever stocks they have at home. So uh, what we f actually saw on ground when this actu eventuated, we did not see much differences in price. 
My personal experience yesterday when I was out doing shopping, a bit of shopping for my family, I saw there were certain items that were also on specials. However, I think the situation that was created, this was exhibited by the social media, uh, you know, platform whereby people were, uh, you know, pushed towards panic uh, mode. And the people need to understand that panic shopping is, n it has negative consequences, not only on the economy, but also on the personal well-being of the consumers. As an advocacy organization, we have been harping on, you know, panic uh, um, buying right from the beginning, from the outbreak of, of COVID-19 uh, in the world. And uh, well before, you know, our PM made the announcement of, of a positive case in Fiji, we, we saw that people were out there in big queues in supermarkets mm -hmm. trying to grab their share of, of uh, food supplies, which was actually not needed because, you know, our government the relevant stakeholders, the suppliers and supermarkets have been assuring the consumers that they are ample supply to meet the demands of the, the consumers moving forward. And should there is any issues, they will work together to make sure Right. that these demands are met right so but we all know that you know that we all have panic buttons and yes. you know as as we were discussing uh, uh, pr uh, previously that uh, you know the people get into that uh, that head mentality and they want to feel control of a situation that they feel will be out of control moving forward mm -hmm. and they feel that you know there should be a dramatic response to a dramatic event when the response can be as mundane as washing your hands rather than buying hand sanitizers and wasting so much of money Right. Yeah. I mean, it was still amazing to see, uh, you know, something like that happen because we had we had bodies like the um, FCCC, CCF, even before the first case was confirmed. Everyone was talking about panic buying because we saw the way it unfolded in China, Australia, and and the U.S. Um, even as media companies in in radio as well, Geraldine and I, and and on all of our radio stations, our news outlets, we were sort of advocating for people not to panic buy even if it if if it does come in Fiji. But Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon and, and Friday as well, to some extent even on Saturday we saw people bulk buying and so so if uh, Mr. Abraham, if you could give I guess uh, the the consequences of, of what happens when, when people panic buy. If everyone starts to panic buy, what happens? Yeah, I uh, see uh, the problem that you will see and this has been confirmed by the Food and Agriculture Organization, by the World Economic Forum. Globally, there is no shortage of food. Right? You've got companies like Tesco, uh, major supermarkets, right? You've got Woolworths, you've got uh, Coles, right? These companies have come and said uh, it is a logistical problem. It's not a shortage problem. Mm -hmm. It's just because you have to understand how the supply chain works. Say in Fiji, the supply chain works differently from how it is in Australia. In Australia, it's a demand-based supply chain. In Fiji, it's a timetable-based, meaning if you are a consumer in Nasori, or say you are a consumer in Bar, right, you will find what happens is that your town is designated a particular day for delivery by wholesalers. Fiji has got wholesalers you can count with two fingers, right? So you've got big ones say like CJ Patel, Asha Bhai, Punjas, FMF. These are big wholesalers, right? Manufacturers, wholesalers. Now, what they do is they do delivery based on a timetable so that every store is serviced. Mm -hmm. And so if they come to Nasori, say, on a Monday and they offload, uh, say, diapers or they offload toilet paper, right? Or they offload uh, flour, uh, rice. Come... Uh, Wednesday or Thursday when there's panic buying, mm -hmm. you'll expect to see Friday and Saturday, Sunday with empty shelves until the next Monday comes right. uh, and then the shelves will be filled up again. So yes, you will expect to see some empty shelves. It's because there's a huge spike in demand. Right? There's two issues. One is from the manufacturer or the general wholesaler getting into supermarket bulks mm -hmm. and then from bulks into onto the shelves. Now, this process is uh, controlled through internal control measures like filling in goods delivery form or discharge forms. So you don't want uh, businesses to say, okay, now because everybody is coming and buying, we'll relax all of those things. No, that still needs to happen because businesses will protect themselves from stealing or unnecessary right. theft. And because that is happening, I went and personally spoke to some of these raw boys. Well, firstly, they look very tired. Right? They said we, but they're happy because they're getting a lot of overtime, right? They're working overtime hours. But to the point they're saying, we can't do it. 
because it's just too hectic for them. And you have to understand these boys are the ones that lift the heavy cartons, that lift the heavy bags, offload them, get it, and they stack things on the shelf. And usually you'll find uh, a few of them here and there. Right? Now, even supermarkets have started getting on a lot more people, putting people on uh, uh, these duties to make sure these shelves are filled up. And what that has created is one, there's a huge demand on factories to produce. So, say for example, flour mills of Fiji has gone on 24 7 production. So, uh, it's putting a lot of pressure on the supply chain. But at the same time, you'll find that in a few weeks' time, the supermarkets will go entirely empty because everybody's purchased things. Ms. Abrams, that's really interesting, and there's quite a lot to unpack in that particular um, response that you gave us, but unfortunately, we have run out of time for this particular segment. Okay. Right, we'll be back with more after the break. When we left off in the last uh, segment, Mr. Abraham, you were talking about disruptions in the supply chain caused by um, the onset of panic buying. Talk to us about the situation inside Lotoka. I mean, if the people of Lotoka have just come to find out that from midnight they are going to be under isolation, they're not going to be able to move around much. So it makes sense that uh, people there would want to stock up on, on supplies, right? Mm. But what about the supermarkets inside Lotoka? Yeah, so the situation with supermarkets inside Lotoka, our teams are on the ground. Uh, I also have an uh, office in Lotoka. And uh, fortunately for consumers is that FCCC is not closed for business. Our team is on the ground doing assessments. Uh, all major supermarkets, uh, uh, corner shops as well as uh, pharmacies. We've done an assessment uh, as of yesterday. We found, yes, there is uh, certain items that you won't be finding on the shelf, things like FMF flour, mm -hmm. just because the trucks uh, from FMF can't come in. But then there's got, you've got a huge factory in there, Punjas flour. Mm -hmm. And so some of the discussions that we've started as of yesterday is asking the supermarkets to look at alternate uh, sourcing, uh, get flour, rice, and the necessities from Punjas. Of course, then there are things uh, uh, that are very much needed. Uh, mm -hmm. There are certain wholesalers who are based within Lotoka. So we've got uh, the number one brand of toilet tissue. Their uh, manager in Lotoka has assured that they've got enough stock to uh, last more than 14 days. So they've started uh, talking to different businesses, even those that weren't taking uh, their brand of products. Now they are having uh, number one brand of toilet paper now. Yesterday I spoke to the Commissioner of Police to look at uh, allowing at least three things in. One is we've noted in two supermarkets that baby milk has run low. So baby milk, sanitary pads for women, uh, as well as uh, uh, another essential item that we want uh, to be taken in. Mm -hmm. And so we are now looking at prioritizing things. So. It's basically looking at, one, the first priority is ensuring that the virus doesn't come out, that we are able to contain things within Lotoka. So that is priority number one. So I had some discussions with companies outside of Lotoka as well. So I went to RB and the uh, director there said to me, he said, look, we are not worried. We are running uh, low on sugar and we've started limiting it because FSC's packaging plant is inside Lotoka. But the question I asked my buyers is whether you want the virus or do you want the sugar? And so they were then quite happy to go without sugar for 14 days. Okay. So those are the, these are the type of discussions that are happening. Uh, and the situation within Lotoka is well under control. Uh, the uh, CEOs and managing directors of all supermarkets are giving us updates every mm. two to three hours on what's happening. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, there are certain stock that is running low, mm -hmm. but we are looking at alternative sourcing and whatever is essential that needs to go in mm. is is going to go in. Ms. Shandil, if we could just uh, pick up from uh, some of the comments that were made by Mr. Abraham. Uh, so you had said that, that there is no shortage of uh, stock. It is in warehouses. It just has to be delivered according to the timetable. Now, this is still very early on in the uh, in the. Uh, 
what what's happening after the first few cases have been announced. Uh, looking forward, what is the CCF going to do in instances where the warehouses will be supplying uh, retailers with goods? Is there a possibility or do you anticipate certain suppliers, certain retailers hoarding the, uh, the, the supplies that come in so that they can further gouge the prices later on. Of course, at this point in time, we've not heard of any cases like that, but there's a possibility of that happening later on. Um, well, with the, as Sir Joel has said, with the enforcement agency on ground and also CCF team is on ground as well from uh, last week after the announcement made by PM, mm -hmm. we don't expect this, but should we are given any information or should we find anything, we will definitely flag it to FCCC so that, you know, and they can take appropriate action and take these uh, traders to task. And uh, as we said that, you know, the, the most important thing is, yeah, consumers need to be responsible. Mm -hmm. We have been receiving that, you know, they have ran, uh, short of uh, certain uh, um, um, products but that is because of panic buying definitely and uh, it will be have we ever seen that you know uh, there are some shelves that has been empty was never refilled it will definitely get refilled mm -hmm. stocks will come is uh, you know mr. Bajikal, the chief executive of FNF uh, made an, a, a statement yesterday that you know they still have supplies to, to you know produce sustainable uh, sorry to supply sustainably to to the consumers of Fiji he has given the assurance what else do we need so let's you know work together mm -hmm. let's stand together let's work collectively to make sure that there is no shortage mr. Abrahams looking at uh, merchants that do not uh, employ good common sense or good business practices uh, in Lotoka we have heard that there were certain traders that had opened up for business even though the lockdown had been put into place what did the FCCC do yes uh, so our assessment teams quickly flagged this matter to us they said uh, I got a message from my divisional head Western and he said uh, we've noted that there are some non-essential businesses that are open and of course he was able to identify this because of the briefing that we had done the uh, the night uh, say friday night and they quickly went around and noticed that yes 25 percent of the shops were closed but 75 percent of the shops were open and inviting people in for business and these were things like clothes shops and known basically non-essential i think the prime minister was quite clear hmm as to which businesses would be open up uh, open up uh, and even went on to name uh, the businesses. Unfortunately, as soon as we uh, we got information, the first thing that happened is I got in touch with the Commissioner of Police and said, has that advisory changed? Uh, was there anything that we are not aware of? He confirmed that the advisory uh, did not change and that the that, that status quo remained. Uh, quickly, our teams went, contacted the Lotoka City Council, both the teams mobilized, we went around to businesses and saying, if you're non-essential, please, you need to exercise caution. Uh, again, it was not an enforcement behavior. We did not say, no, you need to close down and go home now. We said, look, these are challenging times. There, there's a reason why uh, this has happened. There's a reason for lockdown. And if you remain open, that means more people move around. And at this point in time, we do not want more people moving around because you're putting the lives of Fijians at a higher risk by... Uh, getting people to move around so uh, common sense prevailed and a lot of them willingly said that's fine they close shop and uh, and dismissed we'll have more for you when we come back from our next break stay with us so let's carry on the conversation um, with the economic fallout of COVID-19. I think as, um, as as the Attorney General, Mr. Ayasid Kiyum, on one of the earlier talkback shows has mentioned, and as a lot of um, experts, economic experts are also saying that regardless of the way the outbreak unfolds, the economic fallout is, is, is something that, that that is fairly certain. Um, so this question is to either or both of you. Do you anticipate a lot of businesses suffering or, or, ha or even going to the extent of having to close down as a result of the economic fallout of COVID-19? Well, uh, one of the things uh, that you've seen is with COVID-19 is there's nothing uh, new that you'll find in Fiji that you haven't seen elsewhere. Whether it be panic buying from China to South Africa to the United States to Australia, uh, or whether you're looking at the economic impact of COVID-19. 
the, I think the important thing to note is Fiji has not closed its borders for trading. Uh, yes, uh, we may have some issues uh, in terms of exports, uh, but uh, as you would have heard, the uh, Attorney General in one of the press statements has said that now they are liaising with Fiji Airways to do special cargo trips uh, because the airlines are closed out. As far as the shipping companies are concerned, uh, we had a meeting with the Ministry of Industry and Trade. The shipping companies have confirmed that shipping routes are now open with a minor disruption. They're back to business. So in terms of the economic downturn, yes, you find that people are, are not going to be spending as much. One, because a lot of them have spent a lot of money on food. Mm -hmm. right? So if you have purchased three, four hundred dollars worth of food items, of course, your pattern of behavior will change. If you are eating out, you'll say, okay, you know, l don't let this food go to waste. Let me, let me cook it. So because there's a change in behavior, it will affect, say, uh, restaurants. Right? Restaurant businesses will go down. Uh, you've got Fiji's uh, tourism sector. You're looking at that going down. Now, in order to mitigate this, uh, you'll find that different countries have... Uh, put out stimulus packages. Mm. So you say New Zealand has come with a $12.1 billion stimulus package. Uh, I was just informed that uh, the UK has got like a $300 billion uh, uh, package. So there's a lot of countries that are doing uh, these things to try and pump more money into the country. You've got cash transfers. You've got the uh, uh, chief of uh, IMF saying you need to put cash transfers. You need to look at business terms, etc., etc. So. I think a lot of this will be considered and again it would be uh, quite interesting to have this con revisit this conversation after the supplementary budget on the 26th mm. to mm. see what is Fiji's uh, response and again having said that I firmly believe that you're not uh, only looking at government providing stimulus packages but you've got people who have changed their behavior. Uh, there's one case that I was reading out of India where somebody went to the roadside something that they would usually buy from a roadside hawker for five rupees, he paid a hundred rupees. And when this guy asked him, he said, I know business is down, so I'm trying to do my part in helping you. So mm. I think all those considerations need to be uh, looked at. Mm. And if you're going to overcome any economic downturn, we'll need to do it collectively as a country. Uh, Mr. Chandel, same question, the economic fallout, and especially since Mr. Abraham has spoken about changes coming about in consumer habits, could you talk to us about that? Well, we can expect these changes because, you know, whenever we are faced uh, by any crisis in the world, whether it's GFC and the forecast is that, you know, we it might be worse than GFC if we are not able to cure COVID-19 at the earliest stage. So definitely everybody will be affected. And as uh, uh, Joel has said, that we need to work together to make sure we can get back on ground as soon as possible. And a uh, lot of countries, you know, I was also listening to other PMs announcing the stimulus packages where they're trying to support the small and medium businesses and other businesses so that, you know, business continues as normal. Definitely the consumption expenditure will go down because there will be loss of jo jobs or there will be reduced hours because our tourism sector is, is affected. There'll be less movement because of uh, the flight has been postponed this cancellation and they will be impact on, on, on all sectors of, of any economy so definitely consumers will be affected or not only consumers all the stakeholders involved in an economy all the key players involved in an economy will be affected uh, on the 26th of March we will see a uh, supplementary budget that will be announced uh, mr. Abraham if you could talk to us about some of the things that you anticipate that might be announced or things that uh, ordinary Fijians can expect well, I think uh, uh, if you look at uh, the budgets uh, in other countries, there are certain things that you would expect. Now, again, uh, it's important to note that not just Fiji, but small island developing states, uh, as well as uh, other developing countries may not be able to respond as the bigger countries have. Right? Of course, New Zealand has uh, given a 12.1 billion uh, stimulus package, right? It's huge. Uh, comparatively, you're looking at Fiji doing something in three to four billion dollars worth of stimulus. Uh, we can't, simply because we are a small island developing state. Uh, certain things that I would anticipate in, in the budget is, of course, looking at a stimulus package for businesses, specifically targeted towards the tourism sector. Right? The tourism sector, everybody has to agree that the tourism sector has been 
the sector that has helped us bounce back, whether it be Winston, Serai, or any other natural disaster, that sector has been the one that has helped us bounce back. Now, the other thing is maybe some assistance to our national carrier. Right? Uh, one, you expecting uh, a lot of companies that would have brought in jet fuel that are now keeping it, they're stockpiling it. And because this jet fuel is, uh, is being stockpiled, you expect them to sell it at a slightly higher price. So when the whole world is going to enjoy lower fuel prices, uh, the airline companies are going to, uh, in fact, experience a slightly higher fuel prices. So some assistance there in order to ensure that we continue to bring people into Fiji. Then looking at uh, employment, uh, maybe some adjustments and changes to provisions of, say, sick leave. Uh, I'm also looking at things like uh, maybe some stimulus package for small and medium enterprises to ensure that they continue to have uh, people employed and that they're able to bounce back. Now, uh, a few things in there would be uh, looking at, say, a relaxation of interest rates or maybe some repayment holidays or looking at some uh, or how we respond to hardships. The other thing may be looking at the term of business loans right now. Uh, say if you're paying $500 a month in repayments uh, on a 10-year term, if all of a sudden this term became 20 years, you'd be paying $250 a month. So that's an, uh, that's almost reducing your interest rates, uh, your interest repayments in half by spreading it over a long period of time. So uh, perhaps some of these measures may be at a more, more broader macroeconomic level. But again, it would be quite interesting to see what uh, government comes up with. We'll have more for you when we come back from our break in our next segment. Stay with us. So getting back into the discussion, um, there's a lot of anticipation or I guess um, speculation about the way that inflation is going to affect Fijians in the following following months following this yeah. this COVID mess. So do you also anticipate the price of goods and services going up? So, and if so, how much? Is it going to be a substantial rise, Ms. Shandil? So if, if we Fijians do not stop what we are doing, right, engaging in, in panic buying, that might definitely push the prices up because what will happen is we are creating shortages. We have seen this happening, you know, in, in there have been extensive reports of, uh, of panic buying by, f from uh, Fijians, right? Uh, firstly, we have seen shortage in face masks and then followed by sanitizer and now people are also running after hand gloves. Mm -hmm. And we might see this shortage of hand gloves coming uh, soon as well. And uh, this, this severe shortage of uh, face mask and hand t sanitizer means those people who will be actually needing these supplies, you know, for example, our medical, uh, you know, pr uh, service providers, those people who are saving as frontline, uh, you know, uh, service providers, uh, uh, at, at certain organizations where they need these things, mm -hmm. but they will not be able to access it because there is no uh, availability. And at the same time, you can see the price of sanitizer. Now people are coming up with their own homemade or, you know, the traders are making their own sanitizers and retailing it at a higher price. The price actually have doubled. We have seen through a quick survey that we conducted, the Consumer Council of Fiji went around to all the supermarkets and pharmacies and what we found was that the price of sanitizer, one liter that used to cost around um, you know, 25 to, to $30 is now $39.95 or up to $49. So you can see the hike in price. And who's pushing these hikes in prices? It's us, the consumers, because the demand has increased, the shortage, and it, so you know people know that you will uh, uh, you know buy whatever price is given to you at. And uh, we have also seen that people are coming and selling products without labels. The hand sanitizers are being sold without labels, so consumers don't know what the contents are, whether the contents are right for usage, whether that is a sanitizer that we actually need. Right? And this is not only happening in Fiji, this is happening everywhere and the WHO has also made a statement where they're saying that, you know, the, the supplies can put the health workers at risk because if this is not, uh, you know, abundance in supply or not available to these people, then what happens is that, you know, uh, those caregivers or the health uh, caregivers will not have enough. And what will happen if, if this coronavirus, the COVID virus continues, right? and it, it is not kept to the earliest, how will they provide uh, assistance 
to those who are sick. Mr. Abraham, the same question, but with that, just adding on um, instances where traders are trying to profit while they have increased the prices, while they know that the, dem the demand for certain uh, products and goods has increased, they also try and, uh, shall we say, create loopholes themselves. Now, case in point, face masks. Uh, number one, of course, the WHO has said that unless you are a carrier or you have come into contact with someone who has a confirmed case of COVID-19, you do not need to use a face yes. mask. However, herd mentality wise, people are still buying them. Now, yesterday I went to a particular um, um, supermarket and just where the cashier is, there was a box of face masks where they were being sold, each one separately. Mm. Now in cases like that, what does the FCCC do? How do you combat that? Yeah, I think the first and foremost thing is looking at a general advisory to consumers, you know, because hey, as long as there's a market, you'll find that people will use this insurgence of demand as a means to profiteer, right? Of course, uh, going after uh, retailers and people who are selling this is generally a reactive thing. But as uh, Seema said, that in fact we have given rise to this problem. Uh, one people, because we are in panic mode, we are not stopping taking a moment to think and maybe do some research. Now, it's not only COVID-19. Organizations like the FCCC and the Consumer Council for ages have been saying, please, ensure consumer responsibility. You're buying a fridge, go research about it. You're buying uh, food items, research about it. The reason why we enforce labeling requirements is because we want you to know, have more consumer information. Now we've been hitting the point about consumer information. Unfortunately, people are not doing their research. Now it's the N95 masks that uh, is going to help you uh, against uh, COVID-19. And what WHO has said in a statement that there is a shortage of this mask, not in Fiji, globally, and they want health workers to have it. Mm. And uh, people who are at the front line trying to fight COVID-19 to ensure that COVID-19 does not spread, right? So they specifically want this mask to go. In fact, I've got an article here by the World Economic Forum that says panic buying of medical supplies is putting health workers' lives at risk, right? And WHO has asked uh, industry and government leaders to increase manufacturing of this protective gear by 40%. And they estimate that nearly 90 million face masks a month could be needed to fight the virus. So this is serious. And this is only for frontline workers, 90 million a month, right? The other thing people need to realize is that the transmission is because of droplets in the air, right? And uh, you touch a surface and you touch your face. Now you would have seen, and if you observe these people and uh, CEO was saying off the camera, is the sun notice that people are having face masks on but taking it off and scratching their face and then putting it back on. I mean, it serves no purpose. Yep. Then you've got something on Facebook, people are taking out paddings out of bras to sell as, pay, as face masks. And then you've got all sorts of people trying to sell anything and everything under the sun as a face mask now. You go look at the WHO guidelines, half of these masks that are being sold is useless against COVID-19. It's not going to do you any good. People are just wasting their hard-end dollars unnecessarily. As, as for a matter of fact, what we are doing, the number of complaints that we are receiving and then uh, instances of non-compliance is shooting through the roof. And every day we get about five to six uh, different complaints and out of these five or six complaints you find that at least two or three do not have any substance or the people will just highlight it and then not give you any other details right and we expect people to uh, cooperate at this point in time and give us as much information as we can now uh, late last week we executed seven search and seizures on different businesses where we believe that uh, price gouging exists now having said that I understand that emotions are quite high in times like this. We, I had a situation where I had to mediate between a uh, manager of a pharmacy and a uh, particular consumer where the pharmacy said this person has uh, been abusive so we threw him out and the person said I was just raising concern and then I was thrown out. And then we had to mediate to allow this consumer to buy whatever they needed. Now having said that, what happens is because emotions are high, people are one becoming very abusive as well. 
Now mm -hmm. people need to keep a clear head. We no, don't need to get abusive. There's channels to raise complaints. And just because we have an outbreak like COVID-19 doesn't mean the requirements under the law are relaxed and I can go and find anybody I want willy-nilly. Mm -hmm. You still have to process the follow, uh, follow the process of natural justice. You still need to ensure that people are given an opportunity to respond to accusations against them. It's all in their constitutional right. So we still need to follow that process and we are doing it. And so last week, Friday, we executed seven search and seizures. Now, I, I would not like to uh, speculate, but more could be on the way. If such behavior continues, uh, we'll be going to uh, various manufacturers, various wholesalers and various retailers doing exactly the same thing uh, in enforcement behavior, simply because we now no longer have the time to give them a seven-day notice to furnish information. So we have to resort to search and seizure. So uh, this is quite a fair bit of things happening behind the scenes. Of course, it's not prudent to comment on ongoing investigations, but a lot is happening. Stay with us. We'll come back with our final segment after this short break. So in this last segment, I'd like to discuss some of the changes that both of you have made within your organizations as well. I, I know for a fact that a lot of um, the, the concerned bodies, the FCCC, maybe the CCF as well, is now working 24 hours. Uh, you've stepped up your operations. So in response to the COVID-19 outbreak, um, how have things changed for both of your organizations? Oh, there's, there's been a major change. Uh, one. We've already always had a business continuity plan. We've had to spe develop a special continuity plan for COVID, roll out the preparedness plan, I mean, do a mock exercise. And in the middle of the mock exercise, the first case was announced. So it's almost as if you're doing, uh, you're rolling out a plan in real time. And uh, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, but my team has responded fairly well. Our coordination with the CEO, uh, as well as Minister of Industry and Trade, Minister of Economy, Minister of Health has been superb. People are just coming on board. Uh, I'll say the Commissioner of Police and his team doing an excellent job. They're also responding. Everybody's taking their work seriously. Uh, at FCCC, uh, the senior management has got into overdrive. Uh, we're working a few hours extra every day just to provide that additional assistance to business. So we've got a team that provides business assistance on, the, uh, on hardship, as well as consumer assistance on if somebody can't pay their mortgages, et cetera, et cetera. So we uh, got somebody there. We're looking at our prosecution team to uh, uh, explore different prosecution agreements. We're also looking at uh, providing adequate response to people on the ground. As such, uh, we have deployed special consumer response teams into every town and city. Now, we've usually been in uh, Suva, Lotoka, and Lambasa, mm. but uh, you'll find that we've now got people in Nendi, Singatoka, uh, Navua, Ba, Tavua, Reki, Reki. Of course, we've got an entire team in Lotoka, mm. uh, Lambasa, Savu, Savu. So we've put in people, uh, and here even in the central division, we've got one team that covers Nambua, Valelevu, and Center Point, and then one uh, team in Nakasi and the other in Nasori. So that if somebody calls and says, look, I don't have something, we can almost immediately uh, mobilize the team. Mm. And the team is not only looking at specifically enforcement action. I, there was a case on Friday where a particular young mother called in and said, I'm at uh, Shop and Save Nakasi, there's no step two uh, uh, baby milk, uh, mm. S26 formula, the step two is out here. Uh, we called around quickly, found out the pharmacy beside had it, so we directed her to it, and then immediately uh, one of our team members got in touch with CJ Patel, CJ Patel made a special run to make sure that Nakasi was uh, stocked up again. So these are the kind of things, we usually we would not do these kind of things, right? Mm. So we are working in collaboration with the Fiji Grocers Association, with supermarkets, with major wholesalers to make sure if there's any disruption that is picked up, essential things, make a special run. I think everybody's getting together, not just FCCC. I think you'll see a major change everywhere. Uh, everybody's getting into this COVID mode and Fiji, I think, is... Uh, handling it very well. People are prepared. You find that uh, our frontline medical team is working tirelessly. Then you've got the police who are making sure that they uh, follow the uh, lockdown procedures. And it doesn't matter who you are. 
a few businessmen out of Lotoka called me at uh, one uh, this morning and said, look, I was at the border trying to get my truck across, but they're very strict. I said, yes, of course, they're very strict, you know. And so there's been a, a major change as far as our organization is concerned. We've got uh, emergency procedures put in place. We even have got our an isolation room. If somebody starts displaying symptoms, we put them into this isolation room and there's a procedure to then contact uh, the health official. So a lot of things. Something similar. CC of have uh, something similar to that as well. And we also have, you know, um, um, our offices in uh, Lautoka and uh, Lambasa to make sure that we we uh, assist the consumers if they have any issues. We also have a toll-free number should you use uh, any network. You can call 155 if you are faced with any difficulties during this uh, uh, you know, crisis. And we are always there to assist as well. And we are working with relevant stakeholders, as I have already iterated, uh, you know, previously in this uh, uh, segment, that uh, we try to make sure that our Fijian consumers get the best deal even during this uh, crisis situation. However, I think there is a role that consumers need to play so that they can support not only the country but the government of the day as well because we know that our government is trying its best to curb this issue. They are handling the, the, the you know, crisis that is an, at hand, but we need the support. We need the support of all Fijian consumers because if we continue with what we are doing, definitely we will uh, put a lot of pressure on other stakeholders, right? Yeah. All the key, how, the, the key players, how will they make sure that they provide for you when you are not uh, you know, providing your full support? No. So. It's, it's prudent that we ask this question, given that uh, in the following days, following weeks, maybe even following months, we'll see that the number of people who are self-isolating, people who are so, uh, social practicing social distancing, is going to increase. There's also going to be more uh, people consuming things that are on social media. And of course, FCCC and CCF are quite active on different uh, social media platforms. But with that in mind, how do you plan to carry forth uh, your operations and also monitor things where you cannot send out your teams on the ground okay. the CCF continues to push you know messages through the social media platform so to educate the consumers to advocate on things that is actually happening we have seen that these arise on online traders who are providing misleading information about the product so how can you trust them so it, it is the role of the consumers to make an uh, informed decision. If the information is not fully provided, please do not proceed with the patches with the online traders. Also, I think it's very important for the consumers to believe in credible news. Right? You can see so many things are being posted on Facebook. So many, the, It is making the situation even worse. So it is the sole responsibility of us Fijians, all the consumers in Fiji, to believe in the credible news, not to follow on the fake news and start panicking and doing things that is not warranted for. Mr. Abraham, your uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, so what the FCCC has done, we've put in place an internal external communication protocol. So internally, what the certain things that we're doing, uh, things like staff briefing, ensuring stakeholder briefings are done. But apart from that, the external communication protocol, one is of course media monitoring, so we are screening social media as well. So we've got a team that does nothing except social media screening. And so if somebody uh, messages me saying, look, you know, we found the situation in Lotoka. Previously, we'd say, okay, we'll investigate this. Now we're saying, yes, we've picked this up and we are currently investigating it. So we are already picking this uh, issue up. One was the uh, example of the shop and save uh, mackerel, the red one for $8. Now, when it was sent to me, I was able to, uh, and different people uh, sent me that message. We'd already l went in, looked into the system from June 2019. That is the price that has been there. So, uh, yes, I mean, people will circulate a lot of things. I think uh, we also need to give credit to uh, some Fijians who are now calling out uh, misinformation as well. So, especially you find... Uh, Every day, somebody will say there's a death in this hospital because of coronavirus or another case has been reported here or something has been happening here and something has been happening there. And people are now starting to call that out and say, please rely on credible source. Mm -hmm. Because, see, what's happening is you ought to realize that economics is uh, also has a huge uh, uh, role to play in all of this, right? Uh, there's some people that could be benefiting out of it by... Uh, putting out false information. You've got one journalist yesterday tweeted, they said fuel in Fiji is finishing up and that uh, mobile flex staff doesn't have fuel. The CEO of mobile 
said to me this is fake news they and it gave me the liters of fuel that's exactly there you see fuel companies work in a different way they know exactly how much fuel there is because it's all system based and there is no shortage of fuel in fiji uh, because of the lockdown of lotoka the say ba nendi which was predominantly serviced by the vunda terminal is now being serviced by the suva terminals as well as uh, the police has uh, started allowing fuel trucks to move in and out and so areas that have not been serviced previously is is going to be serviced is a minor supply disruption but there is no shortage of fuel fiji is what a 74 day fuel safety stock and we are in fact having discussions on how we can increase that to up to 6 months so again there is no shortage of fuel and a lot of this fear mongering has somebody has some sort of agenda some people have a political agenda some people have an economic agenda and some people are just trying to sell things right so yeah. you've got groups on viber that is on say corona virus about 1500 people you will find people advertising their products in there people are using social media more often to try and push their things of course our communication systems ensure that we screen this uh, we get to the bottom of what uh, uh, what is there in the post and if it is legitimate then of course we need to uh, investigate it but again we're spending quite a fair amount of time going through a lot of things which is fake so people that are spreading fake news please what's happening is you are using up time of uh, agencies like FCCC uh, even uh, the police i think has gone around looking at people spreading fake news these people could be doing something worthwhile ensuring that we ensure food security ensure that uh, things are there on the shelf ensure that the safety of our people is not compromised but because you are going around spreading fake news uh, resources have to be diverted so please i mean exercise caution Well, um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for on the show tonight. Uh, I wish we could uh, carry on this discussion because it is uh, an important one and an interesting one. But thank you, and we wish you all the best in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, the key phrases are: be informed, practice social distancing, and maintain good hygiene. We hope you enjoyed the show tonight. Stay safe. Have a good evening.